Lee Diamondstein. Welcome to American Architecture Now. Today we'll be talking to Benjamin Thompson. For almost 40 years, Benjamin Thompson's work has been synonymous with distinguished design. As a modernist and a preservationist, he is responsible for giving new life and new usefulness to the built environment. It's a very real pleasure to welcome you, Benjamin Thompson. Forty years ago, together with Walter Gropius and others, you founded the Architects Collaborative. What was it like to work with a figure that was already legendary, such as Walter Gropius? Well, it was, it was great, of course. Perhaps the most interesting thing about Gropius was uh, the total intensity of the man. And he was really the kind of a guy who would talk about a leaking roof or a business problem or a uh, political problem or, uh, or, as I've sometimes said about women, or about food or about love. And uh, he's very natural. He's very serious. And uh, anything you did, he took very seriously. Was Gropius at all involved in that remarkable idea of yours in starting and founding a firm that many of us knew very well called Design Research? That was 1953, and he was uh, involved in the sense that he uh, very much supported the idea. What was the, the idea? What was the idea behind Design Research? The idea was probably most uh, connected with environment and connected with uh, the idea of art, uh, art becoming a part of our lives. And I've never been willing to, uh, you know, discuss art as a, or to recognize art as, as totally museum imposed. So that I really wanted a place in which art is part of the house, the kitchen, the whole environment of living eventually spreading out into the cityscape, into the landscape, and, uh, and we were simply trying to show that picture in design research. But, uh, did it turn out to be commercially viable? Yes, it did. It did. It was always undercapitalized, uh, and so it had its uh, economic struggles. But it was commercially viable and did well at times. In your experience, is it possible and realistic for products to be both well-made and mass-produced? I would say that Miriam Echo is a, uh, a good example of that. And I brought him to this country with this kind of wonderful, vibrant, rich color and fashion, feeling and so on. Uh, they started, you know, with a uh, silk screen process and eventually moved into a, almost a machine, very large uh, commercial enterprise. And they made out very well. We were talking about well-made design. Let's take the instance, for example, of a Breuer chair, a tubular chair. Does our perception of that change when we begin to see it everywhere, both in its original and its copy, does it become a cliché or is it still a well-designed chair? Well, of course, that's been a much argued point uh, 15 years ago why uh, many of us would have been very, and were very upset when they started to copy the Royal chairs and other chairs. The difficulty was that the, uh, the original manufacturers that made them so expensive and fundamentally so fashionable that they were only bought by, only could be afforded to be bought by people uh, with a lot of money. And when you have that happen, obviously, somebody's going to copy it. It's a dilemma for designers, of course, because uh, I think designers should be paid royalties or have some way of making a living. And, uh, but yet, it's nice that uh, things get used and get reproduced. Most modern architects claim that their goal is to bring quality design to a wider audience, to a larger public. And in so doing, <coughs> in many ways, revolutionize modern life. Was that your intention? Well, of course, I'd have to say yes, but I don't think I ever thought of it that way. I was starting with design research, very concerned that uh, you couldn't get, in 1953, you couldn't really buy a chair unless you went to Knoll. Uh, there were several people that sold modern furniture. I think Knoll, Herman Miller, 
and they were so expensive that those of us who were alive at the time could hardly afford them or when they came they were the boxes were broken it was very very hard but did I have a large uh, uh, worldwide aim I doubt it I think I was probably thinking of me and a few of my friends you know well, you thought of lots of your friends when you did one of the more significant project certainly of its kind in the world, Boston Spaniel Hall. I guess it's every city's dream of adaptive reuse. Just what does the term adaptive reuse mean and how does it apply to what you did at Faneuil Hall? There were 12 existing merchants there and they had no heat, they had no light, and they had uh, very little business but they had a lot of life themselves and they'd they'd been in business and their families there for perhaps several hundred years. Long time. That uh, uh, idea of making a Faneuil Hall into a market, you know, I've often thought it wasn't a very original idea because after all that's what it had been. How does the project contribute to the life and well-being of Boston and its residents? We, we closed four streets which uh, of course had a very substantial and very important uh, effect on pedestrianization. And my wife and I had written very extensively, presented very extensively, uh, stories about the need for a place to go in the American city. And we told stories, and we made little films, and we played songs, and you know, we were trying to prove something that uh, fundamentally shouldn't have been that hard to prove. How did it all work out? Well, it's. Uh, it's been a huge success. Did you ever expect know. it to unfold the way it has, where there isn't a city that doesn't want mm -hmm. its own Faneuil Hall? Well, of course not, because on opening day there were 200,000, and, uh, you know, that was a surprise. How do your results at Faneuil Hall differ from what you might have done in the late 1950s or the early 60s? We opened design research in 1953, and as I remember, it was a kind of wonderful opening party, people lined up in the street. But I, I think what I'd like to say is, is probably something else, that uh, in 65, 6, 7, we were in the middle of Vietnam, and uh, you know, the whole world was sort of gray and brown and desperate and, and demoralized, and uh, the need for a place in the city was, was uh, some kind of uplift was even greater than 10 or 15 years before. During the period you refer to, that very turbulent period in the mid-1960s, you were the then dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Architecture. What were your goals at that time, both for the school and for the community? I was very critical. I still am of the jury system. It puts a student into a state of defenses where he is unable to free his uh, mind or his ability just to uh, uh, think freely and respond. And so I think that's that we, we did some things with. We brought in to the school uh, other teachers. We felt that the very often the, the uh, traditional architectural teacher was too uh, uh, stiff to uh, one or two dimensional. Did we succeed? Well, there are a lot of people who feel that way now, but they're not teaching because they got driven out of the schools by uh, the old professional teachers mostly who resented us practitioners, you see. We, uh, we were very uh, unpopular in the schools because uh, we, we worked outside, you see. You once said that most schools of design seem to be back in the 15th century. What do you see as the future of architectural education in this century? You can't teach the profession any longer, I don't think, without teaching people how to build. From what I understand, when your staff begins to work on a new project, be it a hotel or a marketplace, you're known to encourage them to think first like a guest, then a consumer, a human being, anything rather than an architect. If I'm going to design a, let's say, a house in a, in a beautiful field, I'd want to go and stay in that field for, you know, a year or two and get to understand the, the wind, the rain, the, the animals, the whole nature of the place and the time, the seasons. 
and uh, and that before I touched anything. And then I was going to understand the people who were going to live there. And uh, and then after that, maybe we talk about design. And I found that most designers wanted to rush right into the problem and say, well now, just give me the pencil and I'll tell you what you want. You've made several references while we were talking to your wife, Jane Thompson. She is also distinguished in the field of architecture as an editor, a curator, a writer and a lecturer, and vice president of Benjamin Thompson and Associates. Most recently, she has become known in the restaurant business. How did she and you first become involved in that endeavor? In dreaming up uh, Faneuil Hall, we began to say, you know, what, not only we want to have restaurants, but then what kind of restaurants? And we say, well, we'll make, well, let, let's think about the best seafood restaurant we've ever been to. And so we would describe one in Paris, let's say, or in Marseille, or Oscars. Or, now what about a, a French restaurant? And so you'd find one and you describe that, or let's say a, a cafe. And pretty soon we found we were running all of them because uh, we couldn't find anyone to do it. And so uh, we dived into this whole enterprise. I'm sure that your wife has had considerable influence on the development of your own work. What would you say is the most important thing you've learned from this very special collaboration? I dare say that uh, I would certainly call Jane one of the better architects I've run into in the field of aesthetics. Of course, she's had a tremendous amount of background and in the field of just general values, we call it social values or, uh, or other. And all those things have been of great help. Let's go back to the discussion of Baltimore and Harbor Place, a large uh, complex that opened in the early 1980s. In fact, sometimes I think of Harbor Place as a sort of combination design research and Faneuil Hall. Well, when Jim Rouse came up to talk about doing Harbor Place, he said, uh, can you do a kind of design research in Baltimore? What he liked was this kind of effervescent, glittering, glowing, uh, uh, glistening uh, thing. I would call Harbor Place a destination. In other words, it's, a, uh, it's, it's not tied integrally with a city in the same way that uh, um, Faneuil Hall or eventually the New York Seaport will be. Harbor Place is a place you go to. It's not exactly the place on the mountain or up on the hill or an island, but it's kind of an island. And in that sense, it, it's almost self-contained. What was your key idea there? Well, the key idea was not dissimilar with Faneuil Hall. It was food. Uh, Why such a heavy emphasis on food? Was that based on your previous experience? At Faneuil Hall, the emphasis, probably the key, um, the key idea in the whole place was food. And aside from the 15 or 20 restaurants, a tremendous amount of shops selling food-related food products uh, from tea and spice and pots and pans and, and uh, china and glass and so on and so on. So we had to claim that we had some critical mass and the critical mass really was food. So we said if we put this whole food thing together, we'd have roughly 100,000 square feet of food and that's a small department store. What do you have in mind for us in New York that is different from Boston or Baltimore? Well, it's going to be a lot more comprehensive in New York because uh, it's, although it's not larger in terms of, of square footage, in fact, it's a little smaller than Boston, the, uh, the variety is, is really kind of stupendous because not only is there a market or a new market uh, with restaurants above that, but many of the old buildings will have shops of different kinds. Uh, streets will be uh, closed to, uh, for walking. You'll have the place with the ships. you have the pier, which uh, extends out into the East River by about 450 feet. And, uh, and then uh, various kinds of shopping experiences. I think that it's much more diversified than Boston and much uh, richer than uh, Baltimore. And uh, but that is richer in the kind of uh, mix of different activities because New York is so 
uh, so much that way. Why don't you take a moment and run through your plans for the renovation of the South Street Seaport? The building is a market building that we call the Fulton F Fish Market. On the street floor, which opens onto Front Street, onto Fulton Street, uh, big garage doors, uh, vendors selling vegetables, meat, fish, and uh, right on the street itself. How do you manage to keep both quality control and some standards of order and tidiness, just plain garbage disposal mm. and traffic. Mm. Is that very clearly built into the design? Their management, their maintenance is, is uh, been, you know, very, very fastidious. The, the security is, uh, is uh, it, internal police. I mean, you're not being taken care of by the, either the Boston, Baltimore, or New York police. I mean, we, they're on the project, but the actual security is, is uh, controlled by the developer. We have a, a fair amount of, of uh, identity in, in these projects, but the number of people making decisions are just literally hundreds. And at times you feel as an architect, if you're some lonely little guy over there, you know, there, there's a maintenance department, there's an operational department, there's a leasing department, there's an advertising department, there's there's a construction department. How do you update features, for example, of the old seaport to accommodate today's visitors and still satisfy the needs of preservationists, zoning laws, concerned citizens, the original inhabitants of a neighborhood? What uh, are you planning to do there and at South Street in terms of those issues? We first, I think, went through a a group of street materials with the uh, with the landmark group, as I remember, and then we went through them with the city, and then we went through them with the developer, and uh, which is the most rigorous test? It's possible the developer, because with the developer you're dealing with money, and, uh, and that gets to be a real discipline. If you deal with the uh, uh, materials and the problems without any sense of reality as to the cost. Um, you, you can literally say yes to anything and yet you, you know that you can't be responsible for being able to provide it. So what success we had at Faneuil Hall I think was with two materials. It was with brick and with, um, with cobblestone and then some benches and some trees. How many of those elements will we be getting in New York? Well, you'll probably be getting all of them. Uh, but let me just try Disneyland for a minute. Disneyland is artificial, and I'm sure that, that we all know that. Uh, not only does the scale of the buildings change from the first to the second floor, but also every front is a scrub front. And, uh, and there's no, nothing sold there. There's no dirt because everything is cleaned up. And if a horse goes by and performs his duties why a little man rushes out and cleans it because they're afraid they're going to affront the children I guess but uh, uh, we're although we do make a great effort to keep these places very clean we, we trying to make them uh, a part of the city in Boston you can sit on the windows you can uh, sit on the edge of the stage you can sit on the all sorts of odd places I mean it isn't it isn't completely thought out. It isn't uh, an automatic design. But if you set every scene, by then it begins to feel artificial. And I suppose that's my, my thought on the Disneyland situation. You said that we were going to probably get all of the elements that there were at Faneuil Hall. And in that recitation of mine, I included trees. And mm. I was not familiar with the idea that there were often trees at seaports. Well, I'm not a historical authenticist. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what you like. I like trees. Trees are wonderful for people to sit under, and they provide uh, all sorts of places for birds and fresh in the air and do all sorts of great things. And so so I, I, I'm, a, I'm not a tree freak, but I like trees. There's variety. The practice of your firm is so diverse that it ranges from individual structures to complex renovations and rehabilitations of old buildings to the large-scale hotels and commercial area developments, such as some that we have been talking about. It even includes comprehensive urban plans. What 
ties all these interests and projects together? Is there a common thread? There is a consistency in design, in design ideas. And you don't start every one at scratch. And in buildings, uh, you work with a vocabulary of materials and uh, a way of putting them together. I mean, you don't start every building as though you're going to invent the wheel. I mean, some people try to, but I, I don't, you know, I, at least I don't. But I wonder if you have any long-range plans or secret project or future dream that you'd especially care to do that you have not done yet? Well, I haven't been worrying about it too much. Uh, I'd love to do a major park or have a chance to do something like Central Park. I, I, I'm not anxious to do a new city because I think that uh, it's been pretty well proven that it's too hard to do. That is, some very good people have taken a, a shot at a c couple of these, and you see them from Sweden to, to England to Scotland, and, uh, and they really are not very satisfactory. I'm much more happy working in the existing cityscape and uh, tall buildings, well, you know, for some reason nobody's come around and said, Ben, will you design a tall building? And maybe that's my, that's poetic justice. I'm going to stay on the prairie and uh, not, not go up. What are you building in Ottawa? We're building the consulate up there. It's part of the, the architecture of the capital. So, you, you know, you, you don't want to affront the, uh, all those buildings, and you're going to build in the nature of, the, uh, of that architecture. Did you ever expect your life to unfold the way it has? No, I just had mine, you know, keep going. You have to, you know, as we know, uh, be awake and using the word seizure opportunities. If you don't do that, by everything passes you by and some other guy walks in and, and he grabs it. And then you're standing there and you say, you know, I didn't know that was going on, so. If you had it to do over again, what would you do otherwise? I'd like to be Darwin, see? And I don't know, I'm sure I wouldn't invent what Darwin, uh, Darwin. invented or thought Why of. Darwin? If you read his, yeah, that wonderful little book that was written about the trip of the, the what's it, the beagle or the bagel? It couldn't be the bagel, the beagle. <laughs> Only in New York. All right. <laughs> Uh, the trip he took seemed so wonderful, and he went, you know, around South America, and he went to the, all the islands and looked at all these wonderful animals and birds and turtles and stuff. And, uh, but what really impressed me was uh, Darwin and observation, and he brought back all this you know, this wild collection of, of uh, shells and fossils and skeletons and skins and stuff. And then he sat down and he looked at it for a couple of years. And, you know, that falls in with my philosophy of saying, uh, for God's sake, get to understand, feel the problem before you start designing. And uh, it just that the way he did it seemed like such a uh, nice way to do it for the evolution and the revolution that you've been such an important part of. Our special thanks to you, Benjamin Thompson.